more. So glad you made it out uh, despite the weather, and it's good to see you. And we are starting. Uh, well, not starting. We're I guess we're on our third lesson of our uh, uh, gospel meeting, and uh, first two lessons were very good. So I really appreciate those. Looking forward to the next few. So. Um, so, uh, we don't really have anything new as far as announcements goes. I do want to remind folks of a couple of things, uh, as far as our meeting times for our gospel meeting, uh, we'll be meeting uh, tomorrow at seven, Tuesday at seven, and then Wednesday morning at 10 AM. And then Wednesday evening we'll complete our gospel meeting at 7 p.m. So looking forward to, to hearing the DJ's lessons in the coming days. Uh, also, there is a sign-up sheet out in the foyer uh, to make sure that they are well fed while they're here. So make sure you sign up. There's a couple spots left out there. So if you do that, it'd be greatly appreciated. And then also want to remind everybody that we're taking up a special collection between today and Wednesday to help Warren Schultz out um, with the brethren in Zimbabwe and Botswana. Still needs a little over $7,800 to be able to purchase maize for them for the year. And he wants to be able to do that because like us, they're seeing a lot of inflation and they want to be able to lock in those rates. So otherwise it's just going to keep going up. So you want to do that we'll leave the collection plate up here uh, through Wednesday and you can just drop it off uh, on your way out in the evening or you can hand it to one of the elders and we'll take care of it for you so uh, appreciate your help help with that and I know Warren does too and all the brethren out there and that's all I have as far as announcements I'm not going to go through the other ones everything else is on the bulletin so if you didn't get one make sure you pick one of those up and uh, put it somewhere where you can see it and remember it and so we can pray for these folks on here the coming week all right as far as our order of assembly uh, danny's gonna take care of the lord's supper if needed i don't see anybody here right now who didn't take it this morning so if someone comes shows up then he'll be taking care of that uh, mark's our song leader and his first song is number 680 680 if you want to mark your songbooks there, and they will be on the, uh, well, probably on this monitor, since that's what says Psalm 680. And uh, I'll lead us in an opening prayer in a minute, and then Kyle will lead us in our closing prayer this evening. So let's all uh, go to God in prayer together. Our great and glorious Father in heaven, uh, we bow before you this evening, we give you thanks. Uh, for this day that we've had to enjoy thus far. And, and we thank you so much for the lessons that DJ brought for us this morning. And we look forward to his lesson this evening. And uh, we just thank you so much for uh, blessing us with this time that we have to conduct this gospel meeting and, uh, and uh, listen uh, to DJ and uh, listen to his, his thoughts on your, your word, Father. And uh, we just truly appreciate that. And we pray that you would be with us uh, the rest of the week, and we just pray, Father, that that we would all be encouraged and, and stimulated to love and good deeds, and, and that we would grow from this meeting, and uh, we just thank you so much for that. Uh, we pray, Father, that uh, uh, that you would be with, uh, with the brethren in Zimbabwe and Botswana and, and Warren, who's serving them, and we just pray, Father, that that uh, their needs would be able to be met this coming year with, uh, with food. And uh, we just pray, Father, that you would be with uh, the brethren over there and, and help encourage them and, uh, and knowing that they are such an encouragement to us. Um, we just thank you so much for them and thank you for the opportunity to be able to help them out. Um, we uh, uh, pray, Father, um, uh, for those uh, who are on our bulletin that uh, need your special care and attention. And we just pray, Father, that you would be with those folks. And we, you know what their needs are, Father. And we pray that you would take care of them and comfort those who are sick. And uh, we just pray that your healing hand would be upon them. And um, uh, 
we just pray that you would help us to serve them any way that we might be able to. Uh, we especially uh, pray that you'd be with uh, Amy and, and her family and the loss of her stepdad. And uh, we just pray, Father, that you would bless them with, with the peace and comfort that only you could provide. Uh, now, as we prepare to go into our assembly and our service uh, this evening, we just pray, Father, you would be with us. And we just pray that each one here would be encouraged and that you would be glorified. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Number 680. There's not a friend will be our first song this evening. Good to see everybody. There's not a friend like the Holy Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. None else could heal our soul's diseases. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. No friend like him is so high and holy. No, not one, no, not one. And yet no friend is so meek and lowly. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all. This will be the song. See, I don't think we have any. Does anybody here need to partake of the Lord's Supper? Okay. This will be the song before the song before the lesson. <laughs> <laughs> have you a heart that's weary, tending a load of care? Have you heard? 
I hope is built on nothing less. Ready? DJ? Ready? Mm -hmm. Good. Good. <laughs> In case there's any nerves or anything going on. <laughs> All right, here we go. 438, my hope is built on nothing less. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails His lovely face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covenant, His blood support me in the whelming flood, when all around my soul gives way, He the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand. the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. 684 will be the song after the lesson. So I wasn't nervous until I was asked if I was nervous, <laughs> which makes me think I have something to be nervous about, so now I'm, that I'm missing, I'm kind of nervous, I don't know what to do with that. <clears throat> All right. Um, tonight's lesson is a bit ambitious, so I, I have to forego any pleasantries that I normally would offer at this point and get right into it, because I got a lot to say. So let's jump right into it. Uh, when we think about this series of lessons about the armor of God, one of the key words, if not the key I think I'm going to change this story a couple times as I go through this, what the key words are. Um, but one of the key words, I'll say one of them, one of the key words in this Ephesians 6 text is the word stand. Stand. He says it multiple times. Stand. Do this so that you can stand. So when I think about the practicality of the armor of God <laughs> text, I think that it's ultimately a text that teaches us how to stand. Now, of course, that's, that's not a, a conversation about learning how to stand like we do when we're kids, when we're babies, and we're learning how to stand and walk. It's the idea of perseverance. What, what Paul is putting forth in Ephesians and what the, the Bible is putting forth uh, throughout, throughout the text, uh, the span of the text, and especially the New Testament, is that this life, it, one of the things that's revealing to us something we know, this life is not easy. It's not easy. And, you know, sometimes we look out, um, out from the kingdom towards the world, and I think what we sometimes perceive, and I, I would suggest wrongfully so, is that people in the world have it easy. Um, you know, this world's, this world's filled with a lot of pain, and it's filled with a lot of sorrow. It's filled with a lot of disappointment and a lot of heartache. Um, this world is a world of, of hopelessness, where people have reversals like we do in the kingdom, right? Relationships end. Um, 
people that are loved pass. Um, financial burdens come unexpectedly. Jobs are lost. Dreams are crushed. Um, all of us on planet Earth experience those things. People in the world are not immune to that. And I think sometimes we look out in the world and we think, man, people in the world just seem to, you know, they can do all these things. Um, but we forget, maybe we forget what we have done, uh, like them, is they're just doing those things to try to find a way to stand. They're trying to get through this life uh, in a way that is not crushing. And as Christians, <clears throat> we realize when you come into the kingdom, God doesn't say, hey, come on into the kingdom because it's easier here. That's, that's not true either. Living in the kingdom is hard. Um, uh, one of my favorite authors, um, Dietrich Bonhoff Bonhoeffer, who I don't have time to give you this whole story, but he was a cool German theologian during, and he, he was actually executed by, um, by Hitler in the, in the Second World War for coming back to Germany from, no, I'm telling you the story, coming back to Germany uh, from the United States where he was safe. He could have stayed here um, and lived. Instead, he chose to go back to Germany to speak out against Hitler and the things that he was doing. And Hitler uh, put him in prison and, and tortured him and ultimately murdered him um, for his, his beliefs in Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of his famous lines is, um, Jesus Christ doesn't call us to come and live. He bids us to come and die. And of course, he, you know, that was a, a, a theologian's play on words. Jesus, of course, does offer us life, but not in the way that we often think as humans. Um, what Jesus is actually calling us to do is to come and die. And that death is a death that we die a thousand times in this life. It's a death that Jesus says we die every day. We pick up our cross and we follow after him. And what that means is we're, we're murdering our old person. We're putting our person, our person of sin, our person of depravity. We're putting that person on the cross every day. Um, and so we, we suffer a thousand deaths. And it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to stand. It's hard to stand in this world. It's hard to make it through life at all. Um, it's, it's very hard to make it as a Christian. And I think what Paul's telling us here in this text is, this is what we need to stand. These are the things that are going to be required for us to make it through this life at all, but especially as Christians. That if you don't have this armor, um, you're going to get attacked. Satan's coming for you. He's coming for all of us. And he's always, like we talked about this morning, he's always coming for us. And if you don't have something to protect you, from those, from those attacks, you don't have a chance. And so this, this is really just a series of lessons about perseverance. How do we make it to the end of this life? And how do we do that? Not, not by just hunkering down and hoping that the storms of life pass over without pro progressing the gospel or the kingdom, but how do we actually live life? How do we experience it? How do we thrive? Um, how, how are we, as Paul is putting it here, how are we victorious? How do we live a victorious life? The way that we do that is through the armor of God. Um, and so again, that's just another way of thinking about these, these pieces of armor that Paul gives us to think about and to, to meditate on and to, to try to digest the best that we can. Um, these, are, these are meaningful and powerful images that he's offering. Um, these are not trite, right? They're not cliche. Um, they're not, you know, he's not being silly. This is not just a, a fanciful way of ending a beautiful letter. Uh, this is a powerful and meaningful and necessary way of ending a letter. And, and for that reason, we need to take special, special stock in each one of these things, which I think we're, we're, we're trying to do. I, of course, I'm not saying that because I, I'm admonishing you. I, I think we are trying to do that. Um, and so I, I invite you to, to, to go along with me tonight in, in another journey as we try to do that uh, a little bit more um, thoroughly and effectively. So in Ephesians 6 and verse 14, Paul says that we should be putting on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. And so, of course, we have to spend some time talking about uh, what is righteousness. And then we're going to actually spend a good amount of time talking about what righteousness is not. Righteousness in its, in its uh, most perverted form. Um, and then we're going to ultimately talk about how we can, how we can become more righteous um, and how God can help us with that if we'll let him. All right, so let's, let's talk about this a little bit. Uh, someone once preached a lesson uh, that I was sitting in the audience listening to, and, and he said uh, his best way of 
talking about righteousness was to kind of do this weird preacher thing that preachers do with words. Uh, and, and to say that righteousness was kind of like right placedness. Um, it's, it's kind of about putting things in the right place. Now, I'll tell you, I've, I've read, a, I won't say a lot, I've read some people, uh, some theologians that talk about righteousness, people that are scholars, they talk about righteousness, and they kind of all say, that from what I can remember and, and what I've experienced in putting these lessons together, um, say something actually kind of similar just with different words. Uh, one of the ways that I like thinking about it is the way that I introduced it, the, it today, and that is to, to reorder things, right? And that's ultimately what righteousness is. It's a reordering of our life. Uh, in a way, it's, a, it's putting things in its proper place, in its biblical place, in its biblical order. And there's a lot of ways that we can talk about reordering. I think reordering needs to be a part of the conversation when we talk about any of the big biblical topics, right? When we talk about faith and we talk about love, um, the problems that we run into, faith and love, including uh, problems we run into with righteousness, is all about the fact that we disorder things. We disorder things. And we're going to talk about a lot of things tonight that we disorder. There's things that we have in this life um, so, uh, where is it that Paul, I'm, I'm blanking, where is it that Paul talks about, uh, it's in, uh, okay, I'm trying to think about the passage and not telling you what I'm trying to think and you can help me with it, but anyways, <laughs> that's funny how we do that. Um, Paul talks about how, well, where is, it's driving me crazy, it's going to come to me. But anyways, Paul's talking about how people are, are telling this certain group of people in a church, which is the problem I can't, I can't remember what church letter it was, uh, that certain things are good and certain things are bad, forbidding, First Timothy, thank you, Danny, I appreciate that, well, great job, great job, um, where, you know, there are going to be people that come into our lives and, and try to control us with religion, which is what's happening in Ephesus, and Paul's talking about that, First Timothy, nailed it, Danny, good job, thank you, um, you really helped me on that one, um, for all of you sitting behind Danny, he did nothing. He was staring blankly at me <laughs> as I was up here struggling, making a fool of myself. Um, that was fun. Yeah, because you were enjoying it. <laughs> I know you were. That's all right. That's all right. Uh, yeah, so there, there are people that will come into our lives and try to get us away from God, right? Uh, by being false teachers and of a sort and try to control us by disordering things. And in that text in 1 Timothy, Paul says, one of the things that he wanted Timothy to do was to teach that all things are created by God and are good. Now, that's kind of hard for Christians to think about, isn't it, sometimes? Because we don't always think that all things are good, do we? That's not the basis of our thinking. That's not the foundation of our thinking. We have good things and we have bad things. But what Paul says is in his learning, what he learned from God is that all things are good because all things are created. And all things that are created are good. Now, where is Paul going when he says that? He's going back to Genesis, isn't he? God created all things, and when he was done creating them, what did he say? This is good. He said it's good all along the way. When he was done, he said it is very good, right? Now, what has happened from that point as humans is we have begun to reorder the created order, right? And when we reorder the created order, we take things and we move them out of sync and we become unrighteous. We become wrong. We become unholy. We become ungodly. We become a lot of uns, right? We, we, start, we start unraveling what God has, has brought together, what he has intertwined, what he has made to, to be um, a systemic good. And we, we make systemic bad, right? That's what sin does. And so righteousness is, in, in a sense, putting things back in its created order. Now, just a, a big picture thought here is we're going to spend our entire lives trying to reorder our lives according to the biblical order, right? We're going to spend our whole lives trying to reorder our lives the way that God said originally they're supposed to be ordered. And we're not going to be able to do it. That's, it's crazy. That's, that's our life. That's the reality of it. You'll spend your entire life and you won't completely be able to, even with God, all of God's help that he's going to offer you, be able to reorder that. But someday Jesus is going to come back. And when he does, he's going to fix it all, right? That's the promise. He is going to put everything back in place the way that it once was. And that's the way that it will be forever. There, will, there won't be any more undoing of what God has done. There won't be any reordering of what God has ordered. It's all going to be put back into place. So that's, that's what we're talking about when we talk about, in a sense, the, the, the breastplate of righteousness. Um, he says, hey, you, you have to... Put on a breastplate that is one of righteousness, that is about this idea of righteousness, which is about the, the reordering of things to be, to fall in line with how God has 
has ordered things. That, that's an overuse of the word order, I'm sorry. Now, this word is used some 550 times in, in its different forms. And, it, and that's all, of course, I'm look, using the English language and looking up, and so it depends on what version you're looking at, so that's why I said some, some 550 times. Depending on what translation you're looking at, it could be way over that. 550 times the word righteous or righteousness appears um, in the Bible in its entirety. And the first time is with Noah, where God said that uh, he looked at Noah and Noah was righteous before him. Noah was righteous before God. Now, contextually, if you go back and look at that scenes, that what God is saying is, is that Noah was acceptable to God, right? God, Noah was, and that's in contrast to the rest of the world. Everybody else is not acceptable to God, the way that they're living. They're living a disordered life. Noah is living an ordered life, according to God. And so Noah is acceptable to him, and the world is, is not. Um, now, when you think about that, the first appearance of that word is there in Genesis, but it actually goes all the way back to the beginning. The concept of righteousness goes all the way back to Adam and Eve, like I just talked about. Uh, Adam and Eve are created, they're naked and they're not ashamed. They sin, right? They disorder things and all of a sudden everything falls apart and they're hiding from God, right? And God confronts them and then they're cast out of the garden. They're separated from God. And then from there, it, as far as it goes with mankind, it snowballs from that point on. Now, maybe, maybe the reason that God chose the breastplate to accompany this concept of righteousness, which is a hu obviously a huge concept. That's why I bring up the, many, the number of times it's brought up in the biblical text. Uh, maybe the reason that he, he chose the breastplate to, to kind of go along with this is because the breastplate is the thing, right? That, that piece, I don't have a picture up anymore, I don't know why I look there, is that piece that, that goes basically from belly to neck that covers all of the vital organs. It's, it's the thing that keeps you from getting stabbed through, right? It keeps you from, from having all those things that will, if they're damaged, cause you to die, protect it. It is, it is vital, right? It's vital. It's a vital piece of armament in that it, 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 it keeps you going. Uh, it, it allows you to stay alive even though you're out fighting this battle. Um, that might be the idea. That might be the idea. If that is the idea, um, one of the things that we have to think about is then justification is vital. So I, I mentioned this morning, I'll kind of do a parallel thought here. I mentioned this morning that, you know, we talk about truth a lot as Christians, um, but truth is just an important concept. And I'm going to say, I think this is a shared, this is a shared thing with righteousness and justification. I think righteousness and justification are things that are vital to humans, not just Christians. Now, if you go out in the world, Christian people in the world are not going to use Christian words. They're not going to talk about righteousness, and they're not going to talk about justification. But everybody, everybody is trying to, to have some form of justification, some form of, of righteousness. I'm going to plant that seed. We'll talk about it a little bit later as, as we go on. Um, and another thing about the breastplate that's, that's interesting, just when you think about the way Paul might have been thinking about this, according to the way that it was used in the time in which he, he originally penned these ideas, is the breastplate for especially Roman soldiers oftentimes carried the insignia of Rome, right? So you think about that. If you're a Roman soldier and you're going out to fight against some other nation and you're, you're, the whole idea is you're going out to conquer that nation, you want to assimilate that nation into your nation. You want to win it, right? And so the, the first thing you want the people, the, the enemy, to see is what? Who you're fighting for, right? This is, this is what I'm all about. This, this is what I stand for. This is what my life is given to. The defense of Rome. The prosperity of Rome, right? Um, now, back to this idea of everybody having a breastplate of righteousness. Everybody has this. Everybody. Everybody. Now, the question is, is it the right one, right? Everybody has something that they wear that has an insignia on it, right? Just follow, follow, just follow with me for a second. Bear with me. This is going to be weird for a minute, I think. Everybody has something that they wear, that they present to the world, that is their justification. Now, what I mean by that is, it is the thing that they present that says, this is how I know that my life is right. This is how I know 
that my life is important. This is how I know that my life means something. This is what gives my life value, meaning, purpose, right? So if you're a Roman soldier, that's the insignia of Rome. You're going out and you're saying, I fight for Rome. Why am I here? Because of Rome. What's the most important thing to you? Rome. Who are you willing to live and die for? Rome. It's right here. Take a look at it. That's what I stand for, right? They, these guys didn't wear names out there that, you know, said Bob. You weren't allowed to have Bob on your, it, um, that's probably, that's not a, it, that's not a first century name, is it? Um, you know, that you, you weren't allowed to like, hey, I'm, hello, I am. Just want you to know, I'm this guy, this is me. Most important thing to me is me. Here it is. That's not what it was. When you went out to that battlefield, it was important that the enemy knew who it was that was coming. And who it was that was coming was Rome. And those who loved Rome. And those who were willing to live for Rome and die for Rome. And give everything it was for Rome. And Paul, I think, is borrowing off of that imagery when he says, hey, we need a breastplate too. And we need a breastplate of righteousness. And we all have something that we're going to give ourselves to. Now, again, back to this, let me tie a couple things together. When you, or at least one thing together. When you go back to the Adam and Eve thing, right? Satan comes to Adam, or Satan comes to Eve. I think that might be the potluck food talking. Satan comes to Eve and says, essentially what? I mean, what did, let's boil it down. Let's put it into like modern language. Satan comes to Eve and his, his pitch is, things aren't that good here, are they? Now talk about a hard sell, right? That's a hard sell. If you're living in the Garden of Eden, you're Adam and Eve. It's perfect, right? And Satan's going to come to you and he's going to try to let you know things aren't that good. I know. I know. This is a rat's nest you live in. This is pretty bad. And it can be better. But Satan comes and he says, hey, you know, God's actually not out for your... The reason this is like not the best thing, let me explain. He's not really out for your best interest. It seems like God's got your best interest in mind. But the reality is God's just trying to kind of keep his thumb on you, right? That's the pitch. Because he knows when you eat that fruit, what's going to happen? You get to be like him. It's the big secret. Everybody knows it in the cosmos except for you, poor suckers, who God has tricked, right? You peel back the curtain and everybody back here knows and you're just kind of the laughing stock. Too bad. But I'm here to help you, right? Because I'm your friend, Satan. Remember my name. I'm going to be around for a while. And Eve says, you know what? All of a sudden, my view of that fruit changes. Because earlier when she represented it to Satan, what did she say? Yeah, I mean, if we eat that, we're going to die. That's like rat poison, right? I can't eat that. But Satan says, it's not rat poison. That's the way. That's the way to glory. That's how you become something. That's how you become, right now you're a pawn. And if you wanna become something, if you wanna have meaning, if you wanna have purpose, if you wanna have power, if you wanna have influence, if you really wanna become something in this life, Eve, eat that fruit, eat that fruit. And then the text tells us it looks good to Eve. Well, why does it look good to Eve? Because it's completely changed what it's offering, right? Before it's offering death, now it's offering life. And so Eve grabs it and she eats it. And not only does she eat it, she takes it to the only person she has or maybe the person she loves the most and she says what? You have to eat this. And maybe Adam says, we don't know, maybe Adam says, woman, you crazy. Like, you remember what God said about that? And she's like, no, it's a lie. All of it, look at it. That's all kind of like not told to us what that conversation really was. It just says she it kind of makes him look like a ding dong, really. She brings it and he eats it. It's like, okay, we'll eat it. I don't know if that's how it happened. She brings it to him. She convinces him, probably tells him the same story. He eats it. Now they're both dead. They're both dead. But what they've done is they've decided, I want to have something meaningful. I want to be something meaningful. I want, I want to, to have something that I can wear that says, look at me. And what happens? They're naked, they're ashamed, they're hidden. And isn't it interesting that God tells us that one of the very first things they do is what? They make clothing for themselves. 
Now, I think sometimes we look at that and we think, well, of course they did because they're naked. They're embarrassed. They're walking around naked. Of course they made clothes for themselves. But I think there's more imagery in that than we often give it credit. They make clothing, but what do they make it out of? They make it out of leaves. Okay, now let me ask you something. In a world now where things are going to die, is leaves the best choice? I mean, I, I don't, you know, we have all sorts of like artistic illustrations of what this might have looked like, and that's great and weird and awkward. But the reality is, that's a horrible choice. That's a horrible choice. Because you're going to make clothes today that in a couple days are going to do what? They're going to die. You've removed them from their life source. You now are making clothes out, clothing out of them, and they're going to be dead. And then what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to make some more, right? And so pretty soon, what is your life going to consist of? And this is not a sermon about not being a shopaholic. What is, what is, what is your life going to consist of relatively soon? Making your clothing, right? Making your clothing, making your clothing, making your clothing, making your clothing. And it is interesting to me that when it's all said and done and God has the conversation with Adam and Eve, by the way, this is cool. He has a conversation with Adam and Eve, right? There are consequences, but there also are promises in that conversation, right? And then when all of that is done, what does God do? God clothes them. And in comparison, which is the greater clothing? God's. And in reality, would they really have, unless they outgrew it, unless they went to potlucks all the time, if, if, would they have to remake those clothes? Probably not, really. I mean, that, when you think about leather clothing, leather, right? We have leather jackets that get passed down from generation to generation to generation. I mean, leather can last a lifetime. God makes them clothing essentially that will not, will not wear out. And so we have this idea set up for us in the very first chapters of the Bible that this is how history is going to go. History is going to be mankind wanting to be something meaningful, something special. And they're going to spend all of their time trying to clothe themselves with their own work that ultimately is just going to rot off very soon after it's accomplished, right? But then there's this underlying promise that's always there, that God will clothe you, and Jesus tells us how he's going to clothe us in righteousness, right? That clothing us in righteousness is going to come later on down the road from a guy who's going to destroy the guy who convinced Eve to sin to begin with, right? See how it all lays out? And that's essentially, I mean, it's kind of a spoiler, right, at the beginning of the Bible. It kind of tells us how the whole thing's going to go down. We just don't know what the details are. And so when we think about righteousness, righteousness is this thing that humans have from the beginning of time, since Adam and Eve, they've been trying to make their own righteousness. And like Adam and Eve, it just, it just doesn't work. You have these limited options, really, <laughs> right? When it's, how am I going to determine whether my life is right? How am I going to determine whether my life matters? Well, we can trust in ourselves. We can put attention on things like our bodies, our careers, our possessions, Again, not things that are inherently bad, but in, in unrighteousness, we're disordering them, right? We're trying to use temporary things to make an eternal statement about ourselves. I have inherent value. Well, how do you know that? Well, because, look at my body. Obviously, I don't, I don't take that route. That's not the route that I've taken, but some people do. Look at my careers. Look at my education. Look at how much stuff I've accumulated, which, by the way, in the possession accumulation thing, you can put relationships, right? Some people have thought, I will mean something when I meet the person of my dreams and I marry them. Those of us that have gotten married realize that doesn't work either. Really, even though I love the woman of my dreams and I have her. That, that doesn't accomplish for me what I'm trying, if, if that's what I was trying to do, accomplish for me what I would be trying to accomplish through that, that, that obtaining of a relationship. We try things like our accomplishments, our, our recognition um, amongst other people. It can go on and go on and go on and go on. These are all fig leaves, right? This is all foliage. This is all stuff that as soon as we get these things, how do we feel? We, we work hard, we obtain them, and we think, my life is right. Seal of approval. I'm done. And then something happens, usually very shortly after that, that we realize, well, that didn't do it. There must be something else. 
right? The relationship didn't do it. Maybe money will do it. Did you get a bunch of money? No, the money didn't do it. Maybe the house will do it. Get the house? No, the house didn't do it. Maybe I need to get educated. Maybe if I get educated. You get educated? No, I didn't do it either. You know, we only have a limited amount of days to spend on this earth. I just talked about nearly a lifetime of work. We, and we see it all the time. People spend days, weeks, months, years, and they get to their deathbed, and they look back, and they say, I still don't know. I still kind of don't know what this was all about. I still haven't figured it out. What, what is there that I can have that will make me right? We can trust in ourselves. It doesn't work. <clears throat> or we can trust in God. Now, when we trust in God, how do we know we're trusting in God? We start focusing on things that are heavenly, like we're talking about, we talked about this morning, right? Things that are beyond this life. Things that, that have an, maybe are, have a work and an effect here, but ultimately are about eternity. We, when we focus on trusting God, we all, all of a sudden, almost miraculously, begin to pursue things like the spiritual well-being of others. That becomes of utmost importance to us. And honestly, this is how churches grow. Churches grow when they realize that righteousness is not theirs, that it's somebody else's, and it's been given to us, and it's been accomplished for us. And now we get to go out and tell all these people that are, that are kill, literally killing themselves, trying to make their life right in ways that they never can, that it doesn't work. That's the good news. The good news is there is something that works, but it is completely otherworldly. It's not here. Everything here is big leaves. And when you, when you trust in God for your rightness, then you don't, need to, you don't need to worry about it anymore yourself, right? That doesn't mean you don't stop trying to be right and have God work on you. Obviously, I'm not saying that. That would be silly. That would be ridiculous. As a matter of fact, it's quite the opposite. When you really trust in God for your rightness, and you understand what it is that you've been given, man, you start working hard. Because you start, you start realizing that that is a gift that I can never really live up to. I can never be worthy of. I can try to live worthy of it, and I'm going to. I'm so thankful for what's been done for me that I'm going to give every second of every day to show God how thankful I am. And it changes the way that you start relating to other people. You, start, you realize you're free so that you can go and you can think about things like the maturity of the church and the glorification of God exclusively. Right? We don't have to share airtime with God anymore. Yeah, okay, God, yeah, God's the main guy. But hey, if you don't tell me I'm doing good, then I'm going to be hurt by that. I'm going to be bothered by that. Right? No. Your ego magically starts disappearing. It just starts going away. You don't have ego problems anymore. You don't need to be complimented. complimented. You don't need to be built up. But you're, you're suddenly free to build others up and to compliment others and to help them. That's what having true rightness is all about. It's not something that you do for yourself. It's something that's been done for you and you wear it. And that's what you stand for. That's the army that you fight for. It's, again, something that is completely upside down from what this world suggests that rightness is. Now, what we just described, of course, I've, I've tried to stay away from the word. Because it, if I start with the word, then people tend to shut their ears off and not want to hear me anymore. The, the, the hyphenated word. The, the word that nobody wants to hear that they might be. What we just described is self-righteousness. That's what that is. Now, we don't like that word because that word's been probably thrown at us. Right? At some point in our life. Someone has looked at you... Because you've made good moral choices and they have thought you or have called you outright self-righteous. And you just, oh, I just don't like being called self-righteous. I don't. And that's, that's good. You shouldn't. And hopefully after this lesson, you hate it even more. Right? That's, that's the, kind of the idea. But nobody wants to think of themselves as self-righteous. Nobody wants to. But that's, that's, that's the, the dichotomy that God is setting up in his word. You have a choice. You can be self-righteous or you can be a person of faith. That's, those are the only choices you have. You don't get to choose. There's no middle ground. You are someone who is living self-righteously or you are someone who is living by faith. Faith is trust. I trust in God for my rightness. Period. Period. 
Not I trust in God for some of my rightness, that is the rightness that I can't accomplish on my own, so I still get a little bit of claim to my own righteousness. That is not how it works. That's not how it works. It is one or the other. That's what the Bible teaches. If you are self-righteous, then you are not a person of faith. If you are a person of faith, then your righteousness is not your own. You are not self-righteous. And so what you wear on your breastplate are not your accomplishments. They're ultimately the accomplishments of Christ. Now, one of the best cases of this, and this is the ambitious part of the lesson, one of the best cases of this is Jonah. If you want a good case for self-righteousness, it's Jonah. Who is Jonah? Is Jonah a bad guy? I mean, he gets a bad rap amongst Christians, but, you know, that's kind of messed up. And, and, and honestly, it's a little bit short-sighted of us, I think, when we just give Jonah a bad rap without really taking a good look at Jonah. Who is Jonah? Jonah's a prophet. Well, who chose him to be a prophet? Do you think Jonah chose himself to be a prophet? I went to school for X amount of years so that I could become a prophet. It's typically not how it worked. That might have been it, but I don't know. He was a prophet of the Northern Kingdom, so I don't know. Things were kind of, you know, silly up there for a minute. I don't think so, though. Because God's calling Jonah as a prophet. And he's not backtracking and saying, Jonah, you should, really, come on, dude. I mean, you're not really a prophet. But hey, since you call yourself one, I'll use you. Jonah's a prophet because God called him to be one. Which means Jonah is a religious man. Jonah knows, to some extent, what is right and what is wrong. And if you're a prophet in the northern kingdom, and God's using you, let me tell you, you've got a tough gig. Because you've got all sorts of moral relativity going on up in the northern kingdom, right? you got all sorts of people that have convinced themselves that they're right and they're wrong. And, and in the northern kingdom, you don't have the nicest people. you got some rough folks living up there. And if you speak out, I mean, they're, they're cutting the heads off of kings up there. So they're definitely going to be cutting the heads off of prophets up there. That's not an easy, that's not an easy calling <coughs> to be a prophet in the northern kingdom. But that's who, that's who Jonah is. So I want to think a little bit about a, a few verses here. I want to, let's read through this. We'll talk about it. And uh, then we'll, we'll kind of learn some lessons to be done. But in chapter 3, let me look at verse 4 and 5 first. It says, Jonah began to go into the city. This is after, so we all know the backstory, right? Everybody here, if you don't know the backstory of Jonah, raise your hand. And you won't be ostracized. <laughs> Okay, don't want to kill minutes that I don't have. So, Jonah chapter 3, Jonah just got barfed up. It's, it's a gross story. In verse 4, Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Okay, now, again, I think, I'm trying not to be silly here, but there had to be more of that lesson, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight words. If this is if the, if this is the actual lesson, if Jonah is walking through Nineveh, and he's saying, "In forty days, you're all gonna die. In forty days, the city's falling. In forty days, it's all done. In forty days, guys, forty days. That's all you got." He's either the best preacher ever, besides Jesus, or these people were like supremely primed and. And, and I guess maybe there was more to the message, but this is kind of, maybe this is just the condensed version. 40, this isn't a three-point sermon. It's a one-point sermon. 40 days, and you guys are done. Now, what would you expect with a one-point sermon? From a prophet who doesn't want to be there in one of the most wicked cities on planet Earth at the time. What do you expect? Not much, right? And it goes on, as we know, and the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them. And the greatest of them we read in the next section is the king himself. The king himself hears the message and he believes. And he, and he, and he declares this, this fast and this repentance so that God may not destroy them the way that he said that he was going to. Now this, talk about church growth. I mean, if it was like this, right? Every church would be busting at the seams. Just go out there. Eight words? All right. I'm good. What, of course we know, what, jo what Jonah's response to that should have been is what? Rejoicing. Exactly. Yeah. But in chapter 4, it doesn't happen that way. Right? Chapter 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, 
And he was angry. This says, it says this a couple times. He's angry. He's an angry guy. He's angry. Jonah's angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is it not this what I said when I was yet in my country? And I want to, I'm going to, I have to put a pen there because I didn't put it in the notes and I'm going to forget if I don't say it now. Listen real carefully to that statement. Is it not this what I said when I was yet in, what are the next two words? <coughs> Whose country is it? <coughs> Whose country is Israel? Isn't it interesting that Jonah says, my country? Bro, you better step back. All right. When I was at, yet in my country, that this is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? I, I, I don't know, but I imagine that being a very soft voice when God said that. Do you do well to be angry, Jonah? This is also what he said um, to, um, to Cain, right? Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city, I guess not answering the question, and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it, in the shade, till, um, till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God, okay, and I'm going to point something out here that I'm going to forget. Sorry, I, don't, I didn't plan this, but I, I just remembered all the things that I forgot to put in the notes, and I just need to say it, or I'm going to forget. Okay, when we were back in Genesis, Adam and Eve, what did they do? They made themselves what? Okay, were they adequate? Jonah leaves the city, he goes up on a hill. What does he do? He builds a shelter. Was it adequate? It wasn't. How do we know that? Because God had to provide him shade. Right? Okay, we see the same mindset in both places. Same kind of thing is going on in both places. He sat under it in the shade till he, sh uh, till he should see what would uh, come of the city. Verse 5. Verse 6. Now the Lord came. Now the Lord, God, appointed a plant and made it cover up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die. And he said, it is better for me to die than to live. Now that sounds so dramatic. <laughs> like so ridiculously. I'm not talking, I'm talking about like the dumb kind of drama. That sounds so dramatic, does it not? I just want to die if it's going to be like this. I, and I'm obviously going to suggest, I don't think this is silly. I think that this is real. There's something going on with Jonah here, spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, that is extremely disordered. There's something very, very wrong happening here. This man literally doesn't want to live anymore. And you look at it and you think, because of bad weather? But that's obviously not the case, right? And we're going to get to the bottom of it here at the end. Verse 9. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And Jonah said, Yes. That's how I imagine, imagine him saying it. I do well to be angry. Angry enough to die. Now, let me ask you something. Do you really believe that this anger, this level of anger, this level of distraughtment, this level of distraughtment, I think that's a word, this level of disheartenment, this, this, this level of anguish that Jonah is experiencing, do you, do you believe that what is happening here is really the result of a failed construction attempt and a couple dead plants? I mean, do we really think, in, 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 a, in a windstorm, do we really think that that's how petty this man is. I, I just, I'm having a hard time with that, honestly. I don't think that's it. There's something else going on with him, right? We know that because this is what happens. In verse 10, And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. Okay, now this is a parable, right? God has just given Jonah, given Jonah a living parable, and Jonah is not getting it. Clearly, he's got an open mouth, dumb look on his face, because then God goes on and explains. And should I not pity Nineveh, 
that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons. 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left. And also much cattle, which I don't entirely know how to explain that, that last statement there. But we're going to act like that's not happening right now. <clears throat> Think about the symptoms that were shown here. The first symptom that God reveals to Jonah is an absolute lack of love for this city. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost astonishing, is it not? Now, let me, let me take you to another place where God is going to come and judge a city. You remember another place where God's going to come and judge a city in the Old Testament? Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you remember, do you remember the conversation that takes place be before the Sodom and Gomorrah judgment happens? It happens when, and this is, this is a hard text in some ways to understand, but essentially God comes and has a conversation, and we can't tell if it's through an angel, if it's actually God that like shows up on the scene somehow, has a conversation with Abraham. And he lets him know what's about ready to happen. Now, this is a great contrast. Do you remember what Abraham did? He begins to negotiate with God, right? And he says, what if there's X amount of people? I can't remember the numbers because I'm not good at numbers. What if there's X amount of number of, of righteous people? Will you spare the city? And God says, knowing, of course. Sure. Yeah, I will. And then Abraham thinks, maybe. That was too easy. What if it's a lesser number? Yes. What if it's a lesser number? Yes. What if it's a lesser number? Yes. 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 All the way yes. Every time, yes. And you get to kind of the end of that conversation. And you, you start thinking, I wonder if Abraham's thinking at this time what I'm thinking. And that is that the number is actually zero. Right? There are no righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. Even the ones that he ends up saving are entirely righteous. If you read the story afterwards, it's not... It's not Lot and his family are not unaffected by Sodom and Gomorrah, right? <clears throat> Abraham is begging God, please don't destroy the city. Please don't destroy the city. Jonah is saying, please destroy the city. Now let me ask you, which person are you? Now be careful. That is a bit of a trap. Which person are you really? I'm not talking about the person you want to be, but which person are you really? I, I've been talking a lot about this recently because this is a thing right now in our state. Christians are trying to get out of this place as quickly as they possibly can. It's like, this, it's like the state is a sinking ship and they got to get off quickly, right? Now, let me ask you, if everybody that wears the blessed, the, the blessed, Plate. It is. It is blessed. The breastplate of righteousness leaves this state. What's the condition of this state? And what, what mindset should we have according to the end of Jonah? If God was talking to us about California, right? Go to California. Number one would be the message. Don't leave it. Run to it. Get there as quickly as you can because judgment's coming for these people. Everybody's walking around wearing fig leaves, sometimes literally wearing fig leaves in this state. They don't know their right hand from their left. Is that true? It's getting more and more so. We're living in Nineveh. We're living in Sodom and Gomorrah. It's getting that way, right? And God says, go, 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 because judgment's coming, go. And you know what? Judgment is coming. There is a day fixed in time. There's a day fixed in time. I'm sorry, I get passionate about this. There's a day, I'm going to calm down. There's a day fixed in time, we know, where the Lord has told us he is coming back. And every day that we live is one day closer to that time. The, the, the time is ticking away. Judgment is coming for this state and all states and all countries, the entire world. And when people don't know their right hand from their left, that's where Christians should be going. Running to it as fast as they can. Not trying to get away from it. God says their sins have come up before me. 
right? And the way that we see that is there's sins have come up before us too, and I can't wait to get out of here. I can't wait to get out of here. We need to be encouraging each other to stay. This is not an easy place to live. And sometimes we have to leave because we can't afford to live here. That's a totally different thing. And sometimes we have to leave because jobs are somewhere else, and that's a different thing. That's not what I'm talking about. But people that live move to places like southern states in our country and think, wow, the grass is really greener there, and this is really great, and they've, got a, they've actually got a Noah's Ark there. And we should go there. I mean, you couldn't build a Noah's Ark in California. They've got a Noah's Ark. Let's go there. That's not where they need Christians. They're where the breastplate of righteousness. They need them here. And Jonah is so furious about their, their salvation. That's the second symptom, right? In, the, in Romans 12, Paul says that the mark of someone who is, is, is justified by faith, which is where he's at in that book, right? When he gets to chapter 12, we understand that we're justified by faith. The mark of someone who's justified by faith is they weep with people who weep and they rejoice with people who rejoice. That's how you know you don't have self-righteousness. I'll tell you. Because people who are self-righteous interpret events one of two ways. Is that person and the way that they're living their life and the things that they're doing and the things they're saying, is that person a threat to me? Or, or do they somehow give me some sort of boost, right? Do they affirm me or do they threaten me? That's how self-righteous people think. And so that's why when we're self-righteous, we're jealous. That's, when we're self-righteous, we, we have envy. But when we don't, when we're not self-righteous, when our, our righteousness, when our rightness, our justification is Jesus, then I'm not threatened by other people's successes. And so when they're successful and they rejoice, I can rejoice with them. And when they're broken and they weep, I can weep with them. And people who are self-righteous weep with those who rejoice. And they rejoice with those who weep. That's the truth of it. And Jonah is weeping with those who rejoice. You have a city of 120,000 people who are praising God who are rejoicing that God has brought them salvation instead of destroying them. And Jonah is up on a mountain and he is weeping about it. He's crying about it. He's angry about it. He's angry that these people have had mercy extended to them. And I, I, have, to, I have to check myself, as so do you. I have to check myself. When I watch in the month of June, pride event after pride event after pride event, after Pride event, I go to Starbucks and I'm sitting under an American flag that's been turned into a Pride flag. And I think, oh, oh. What do I really want for these people? Sometimes I wish they would just go away. But you know what just going away is? You understand what that means, right? I want you to just stop existing. I want you to just go away and leave me alone. And stop forcing this stuff on me the way that I feel like you're forcing it on me. Stop. That's sometimes, and that's, that's Jonah. When I think like that, when I have those feelings, when I'm not running toward those people to sit down with them and to try to help them understand that the thing that they have thought is going to give them true meaning and purpose and value and justification in this life clearly is not going to and that I actually know of the solution, the thing that will, when I don't do that, then I'm Jonah. That's who I am. Now that's the problem, and I don't have time to go through this whole thing, so I'm just going to throw this up there. I just want to know, <clears throat> maybe one out of these three, how is self-righteousness <clears throat> solved? Let me share with you my mistake. When I, when I began to understand primarily around the message of Romans, this idea of true justification, where that comes from, what righteousness is, what it isn't, how invasive self-righteousness can be, and also how subtle it can show up in our hearts. When I began to look at myself and examine myself about those things, I began to develop a distaste toward myself first and foremost. But then I began to develop a distaste um, towards others who were 
displayed themselves as self-righteous, which by the way, was self-righteous of me. I'm just gonna put that out there. Okay, so it's a double confession. So when you're self-righteous about other people's self-righteousness, you're in fact self-righteous. So you gotta be careful with that, that happens. When I, when I worked through that, one of the things I came to Jonah, I realized is that God doesn't solve or try to solve Jonah's self-righteousness with wrath. Do you see what he tries to solve it with? He tries to solve it with patience and kindness and charity, love. He tries to solve his self-righteousness with love. Now let me share with you my experience. My self-righteousness <clears throat> only melted away and has melted away to the extent that I understand the love of God for me. And has only kind of stayed away to the extent that I, I, I by faith, trust that I'm free from having to justify myself and now can truly love others the way they need to be loved according to the Bible, not according to what I think or they think, but according to what the Bible thinks, what God says. And God applied that salvation to him consistently. He applied that salvation to him painfully, and he applied it lovingly. But even the pain is love in this text. Yeah, God caused the wind, right? He caused the unrest, he caused the discomfort, he caused all those things but he did it because he's gently trying to show Jonah one really important thing. What is it? What is the, the, the question that we don't have the answer to in Jonah? Because of the way that it ends. Does Jonah ever realize that he's a Ninevite himself? Does Jonah ever realize that he's no different than those people? He's no different. Someone tell me what makes Jonah different. Really, at his core, what makes Jonah different? And that, is that not the point that God's trying to make? The two times that he saves Jonah in this text? Jonah is not worthy of God's salvation. The way that he acts, the way that he lives, the way that he thinks is worthy of judgment two times. One, in being eaten by a big fish, and another by getting a severe wind and sunburn. That's what Jonah's, and it been far worse, right? Those are just illustrations. Jonah's actions are worthy of God's judgment. And the question at the end of the book, and I, you know this, right? There other people pointing this out. This is not new. The greatness of Jonah, the reason it doesn't tell us the answer is because the question is not for Jonah. And it's not for us to really even consider about Jonah, is it? The question is yours, and the question is mine. When we look at Jonah and we think, what a ding-dong. Ultimately, we're supposed to get to the point where we realize, wait a second, I'm the ding-dong. I'm Jonah. Wait, I'm an Ninevite. Wait. Wait. Okay. Yeah. God just walked my, rocked my world. And I, and I didn't ask for it, and I didn't want it, but he did it. Right? And that's ultimately what the breastplate of righteousness is. The reason that you can proudly and triumphantly go out onto that battleground is because you wear the triumph of Jesus. The way that you can stand in this world is to know that nothing can take you down. Not because of your might, not because of your strength, not because of your ability, not because of your greatness, but because of the greatness of Jesus Christ. And to the extent that you wear that, you cannot be conquered. You cannot be. Those vital organs cannot be reached. The, the sword of the enemy, the darts, the fiery darts of the enemy, as it's talked about later on, they cannot pierce those organs that will lead to your death because they're protected by the victory of our Christ. And the question is, are we going to live accordingly? Is that the life we're going to live? So close up your Bibles and let's offer the invitation and, and sing our song, which is a song that's devoted to a moment where we have an exercise and that exercise is to examine ourselves and to consider whether or not we're living a life that is worthy of the death that was offered so that we can live. And the question is, how well are you dying? Jesus Christ bids every man and woman come and die. 
are you? Or are you still trying to live according to your own strength, according to your own might, according to your own ideals of what greatness is and isn't? Jesus didn't come for you to stay intact. He came for you to die. And so the encouragement of the breastplate of righteousness is for you to do that every single day. We, we collectively confess Christ, don't we? We all sit here convicted men and women, every one of us, every one of us. So as we stand, we stand together with no proclamation of greatness over one another. When we sing this song and we sing the words, we sing them to each other. And the proclamation that we're making is that we're no better than each other. We all are fighting the same battle. We all have the same struggles. We all have the same failures. And we all need the same Savior. And we're just standing as maybe a symbol that we're ready to help. We're ready to help each other to do that very thing. So when you think of it that way, there's no fear. There's no fear in confessing your weaknesses in this group. There's no fear in confessing your needs in this group because this is a group of needy people. <laughs> we all are here because we realize we need help. So if we can help you, let us help you. As together we stand and sing our invitation song. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me and that's one thing i know my savior quieted me and now i onward go i know he'll take me through though i am weak and poor and i can't feel at home in this world anymore oh lord you know i have no friend like you if heaven's not my will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory, Savior, up in glory land. I don't expect to stop until I with him stand. He's waiting now for me in heaven open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world just up in glory land we'll live eternally the saints on every hand are shouting victory their songs of sweetest praise drift back from heaven's shore and i can't feel at home in this world anymore oh lord you know i have no friend like you if heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Do you have anything else? We're nope. done with the announcements, right? right? We're good. Okay. Yeah. DJ, thanks. Yeah, great, great lessons. A lot to think about. Just kind of uh, <laughs> good stuff. Thank you. Uh, is there anything else that we need to to talk about before we are dismissed? Kyle, it's in the closing prayer. Mm -hmm. Let's pray.
pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that you've given us and the opportunity to come here and uh, learn more about you and have fellowship with each other. We thank you for the lessons that are being presented uh, this week. We get to learn about the armor of God and um, what it is and and uh, how we should use it and why we need to use it. And uh, pray that we would be able to learn a lot of things from this and that we can um, show others that they need to equip it as well. Pray that you would bring us back uh, the next couple of days, uh, if possible, to uh, hear the other lessons and to finish it out so we can get the whole story. Father, we uh, thank you for your son Jesus and for the many blessings that he gives us in our daily lives. And uh, thank you for uh, his sacrifice on the cross so that we can be in heaven with you. Uh, we pray that we would uh, remember uh, those that were mentioned in the, in the announcements today, that uh, you would um, uh, bring them back to health um, if, if that was their issues and keep those that are traveling safe and uh, just, just be with all those that were mentioned. And uh, pray that you would uh, be with us as we go uh, start this week and that we would always remember to keep on uh, that armor and uh, fight the battle for you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah.